my next, I love the next chapter. How many of y'all love dermatology? Dermatology is like you're a detective, right? Who in here has a really, do you have a good derm book? I hope you do. And I will share with you the one that I really um, recommend, and it is in the back in your reference listing. Um, it used to be, the main author used to be Fitzpatrick, and met, there were many different authors associated with it. Fitzpatrick's getting ready to retire. And so he has rise, he's actually groomed somebody to take over primary authorship, and the name is Wolf. So it's Wolf, Fitzpatrick, and others. And the reason I tell you this is, um, my brother's a dermatologist, and every time I go to visit him, he's like, come look at this. He wants to show me some pictures. He actually does a lot of skin cancer removal. But what I want to share with you is Fitzpatrick is, you can get the two-volume hard copy, 300 bucks, if you want that, in your library. Or you can get the soft cover, short, stubby little book. That the last one I got had a CD-ROM in it, so I could put it in and I could see pictures and so forth. But I think now the more current versions, they give you a code to go onto a website so you can get access. But it's a really good book. And a lot of times the way we treat conditions with um, children, we're thinking about the child that may have a communicable disease. So let's take a little gander through here and see what we're going to come up with. We're going to think about first burns. And the reason we added burns is they've asked some questions on the exam about burns in children. We know we have first, second, and third degree. And it's pretty obvious that first degree dry red no blisters involves just the epidermis. Second degree is partial thickness. You got some blisters, but it's beyond the epidermis. And then you got the third degree, which is more of a dry, leathery, black, pearly, waxy eschar that develops. And it really gets down into the dermis, down even as far down into the fat muscle and even to the bone. For children, remember we talked about, and we didn't get into a lot of detail, but remember I said with the, with the nutrition calories, the youngest needs the most calories. You know why? Because the body surface area is greater in the smaller person. So the, the idea here is if you have a child, especially a baby that's burned, they, especially depending upon where they're burned and how small they are, you can have a greater percentage of burning. And if you'll think about this, the head at birth is 10%, and as they get older, it drops down in terms of size because the head then becomes more proportional for the rest of the body. But a newborn that gets a burn on the head has the largest part of the body is going to have a greater degree. You want to think about all the areas, the 2% of the arms, the chest, front and back, the genital area. So you have to calculate the whole body surface. And that also would be, give you some idea on whether or not they're going to become more greatly dehydrated. We also want to think about, pretty much y'all are familiar with, and we're not going to think about hospital care, but in the... Um, you know, you always have your patients call you. They love you because they just can't do anything without you, right? So they get a burn, they call you instead of going to the ER. And you know that, that you got to think about all the ABCs, drench the burn, thoroughly cool water, do not cover lotion butter. Yes, two weeks ago, I had a patient, after I had done multiple education opportunities with him, had a, his child got a burn, and guess what he put on the child? butter and I had just gone over I write everything down for this patient and I make a copy of it and that you know I just don't understand it but anyways we know we want to avoid that if burn area is limited immerse the site 30 minutes and then if it's large douse it you know with cool water apply clean wraps hypothermia is a huge problem very risky first six hours following are critical get them to the hospital so let's think about evaluating other skin disorders. You want to think about having a very systematic approach, being very organized, looking at the morphology, the configuration, distribution. I always, that's what I do when I get somebody that comes in with a, uh, a lesion. I'll say, where is it? Well, how is it distributed? And you think about, you know, the different individual organ, um, different um, types of lesions. Now, you've got a nice list in your, in your manual. Let's think about this. In your materials, you're going to have primary versus secondary um, lesions. And when we start off with the primary ones, primary
primary ones are pretty much, um, you would think about macules and your papules, your nodules and your tumors. Those would be good examples of just the primary lesion. But something that would be secondary, like it says in your notes there, something that follows a primary lesion would be a patch. How would you get a patch? You're scratching the area. You're getting excoriation, right? How, what about a wheel? Again, it could be because of irritation. Plaque. Think about this. Vesicle, um, bulla, and pustules and cysts are pretty much primary, but an abscess would be a secondary lesion, right? So all of those would be good considerations. We also think about how important it is to um, keep in mind where is the lesion on the body? Is it a solitary, discrete lesion like a herald patch? What's that associated with? Pityriasis rosea. Remember that one? Is it grouped? Is it confluent? Almost any time you see the word confluence, you want to think about tinnias, fungal infection. Tinnias run together. They kind of roll into each other. We also think about things that are linear, annular, polycyclical. I mean, I could go on for the next two weeks just giving you descriptive terms. You all see, you know what I'm saying? And then you want to think about where are they present? Is it on the face only? Is it on the trunk? Is it in the groin? Is it along a dermatome? Which is, you think about zoster, right? Is it on the feet, the axilla? I think about syphilis rash. Syphilis rash is often found in the buccal mucosa on the palms of the of your hands, the palms of your hands, how like that, and the soles of your feet, okay? Usually it's non-puritic, so you got characteristic patterns. So let's kind of take a gander through several of these, and let's start with acne. Acne is really a polymorphic skin disorder characterized by comedones, papules, pustules, and cysts. Cause is really unknown. They think that perhaps activated by androgens, we think about it can be exacerbated by steroids and anticonvulsants. Really food, oh, I eat too much chocolate, is what they'll tell you, is not really a contributing factor. Uh, we do know that, now think about a child uh, like this. You could manage pretty well in primary care, but what about this one? Probably need to bump them, pump, pump them on up to uh, uh, dermatology. It depends upon the whole idea in terms of management is what is appropriate for you in primary care in terms of management? And don't do what you maybe did with your preceptor, because it's not always, you might be doing more than what you're supposed to do. But let's take a look at cystic versus just plain acne. So let's look at this here. We're going to think about comedones, pustules, papules, nodules on the face and upper trunk. Your comedones are your blackheads and your whiteheads. Your blackhead is open. Your uh, whitehead is closed. You may have some hypertrophic scarring, and sometimes women, because of menses, the hormonal influences, it may exacerbate it. Pretty much, you know, none is indicated except to identify a cause of organism. You may think about people who have folliculitis, because that's the hair follicle getting involved. We want to think about um, how to manage. So often, kids, teenagers do what? They wash their face too much. They don't apply enough moisture or they strip it of its natural moisture. So in terms of management, we want to think about what are you going to do non-pharmacologically? You want to think about avoiding topical oil-based products. That makes sense. But use oil-free, mild soaps, cleansers, and moisturizers. And so often people have gotten away from antiseptic or antibacterial types of, you know, soaps and so forth. And so you want to make sure that they are cleaning the, uh, the skin very well. We also want to think about pharmacologically. Well, you've got mild acne, and look at all the different topical treatments that we have. We've got your benzyl peroxides, and then you can also, if it's not responsive to the benzyls, you start off with maybe a retinoid acid. But again, I want to caution you, make sure you know the pregnancy category for all these topicals, because even though it's topical, it could have a higher level. So you want to think about that. It's pregnancy category C. And then remember Trentoyan, if you put it on during the day and you go out in the sun and sit by the pool, it's going to be inactivated, so you're wasting your money. That's why we usually your retinoid acids, your Trentoyans, are all going to be given when? At nighttime, right? At nighttime.
and you don't want to give it at the same time you're using benzoyl peroxide. Maybe you use your benzoyl peroxide during the day and you can use your retinoid acid at night. You also have like your Neutrogena uh, 2% um, wash and sometimes you can see the use of being beneficial, the use of erythromycin or clindamycin lotion and pads. So those can also be added to it. What about if you had moderate acne? Well, moderate acne or maybe severe pustular acne maybe is probably going to be needing some systemic antibiotics. Good choices would be doxycycline, erythromycin, minocycline. They gave you some choices up there. All are of equal value. A lot of folks are using doxy now. Um, also, severe acne that doesn't respond, we really need to refer them. So the picture that I shared with you of the young man with the very severe cystic acne needs to be punted to the dermatologist. He's probably going to need something like maybe either Accutane, which we know has, what, black box warning for suicide, pregnancy protection. You want to think about checking your LFTs. So those are important. Also, sometimes there's treatments like keratolytic treatments that they can do specific treatments that the dermatologist can provide. Fungal infections. This is where you get confluence. And you'll see here fungal infections can be various types of um, fungal infections. We treat based on antifungal therapy and prevention of transmission. A lot of this can be from being in warm, moist heat, um, intertrigo. We're going to talk about that. But the areas that you see this, would be like the scalp, capitas, tinea caporis, body ringworm, tinea curis, jock itch, tinea manumpetus, athlete's foot, and versicolor, which is hypo to hyperpigmented macules um, on limbs. So we think about it can be very mild, very asymptomatic, such as sometimes with the scalp. And I'll tell you, if you've got a tinea in the scalp or on the nails, oncomycosis, nails, Tinea capitis, the scalp, very difficult to try and clear those up. Takes several rounds, perhaps, of like griseofulvin and so forth. But you could have severe itching, pedis, curis. You could have, of course, the very classic rings, the erythematous rings, tinea caporis, and solitary hyper to hyperpigmentated areas. Let's look at these two. A little fella on you. On, the, um, on your left, he went to the barber and had his hair cut. He has an area of alopecia. Pretty much, pretty mild, you know, we can probably clear that up fairly well. But the young person on the right, oh my goodness, pustular um, a scalp, um, you think about capital infection, and then if you were to do what? Scrape and do under, a, take a sample under a KOH prep, what are you gonna see? you're probably going to see the characteristic spaghetti and meatball hyphae, classic for fungal infection. Now, this patient um, that has the pustular um, scalp inf infection here is probably going to need to go on something like an oral antifungal like griseofulvin. You want to be very careful. Isn't this a class of drugs that you want to be very careful, like all your azoles, your ketoconazole, myconazole, because what does it do? It interferes with the whole pathway through the C, P, you remember the 450? Remember that? It is one of those, remember how, if you, if you read through it, the, all your antifungals are one of the ones that interfere through that pathway. So it will block some of your other medications from working appropriately. So you want to always be cautious. And you know what? You're not going to have these patients on it forever. It's to treat the infection, but you got to be aware of that. Look at this foot. Wow, that looks pretty, pretty uh, awesome, doesn't it? And so, you know, that foot probably needs to be soaked and then some topical antibody, um, antifungal and probably something um, um, orally will be needed. And classic body ringworm. Now, the one over here on the right, very classic um, rings, okay? But look at this one. That one looks very much like, what else would be in your differential? Eczema on the face. See, it kind of has some of the placky area in there. Atopic dermatitis would be a very classic one, which is very classically found in the, in the triad of asthma and food allergies and things like that. So while you may think about it, and a lot of times when you treat something, that's why I usually tell patients, let me, I, this is, I always tell them, in my thought process, 
this is what I think. And I let it out for them. And I say, I'm going to start with this one because I think this is the most likely based on what you've shared with me today. If it doesn't get better, I expect it to get better treating it this way. If it doesn't, I need to see you back. And that helps you to diagnose based on the treatment. So there's the spaghetti meatball hyphae that we see classic under the KOH prep. Uh, tinea capitis, um, we, um, do you know how wonderful head and shoulder shampoo is? And don't, if you send them to the dollar store, okay, and you ask them to buy a dollar head and shoulders, tell them to make sure they read the active ingredient on the bottle. Because usually the dollar store doesn't have the selenium 2.5. So head and shoulders, and you can have them use that twice weekly, plus griseofulvin for the scalp. Um, tinea capor and also, what do you follow with griseofulvin? What lab tests do you need to monitor? Your LFTs, your liver function tests, right. And tinea caporis, to uh, topical antifungals, there's your azoles. We use that very much, oftentimes, to help clear that up. Tinea curis, you can use your terbinafine cream. Pretty good. Uh, um, Clearance, 80%, twice a day, seven days, and also griseofulvin for severe cases. Here's the foot, macerated stage, soaking it, perhaps using some oral therapy to complement, and tinea versicolor selenium sulfide shampoo. I usually tell patients with versicolor, take that head and shoulders with the selenium and paint your body with it. Don't mix it, don't dilute it but just put it all over your body and then put a bathrobe on and let it soak. And you can let it dry. Then, you know, they want to walk around a little bit, let it soak into the skin. They can wear a little bathrobe and then do this, say, you know, 30 minutes before they shower and then they can shower. But it really helps when you have them do simple little things like that. So let's look at chicken pox. Remember what we're doing with kids in dermatology? We're looking not only at skin disorders, but we're looking at its relationship to communicable diseases. So here's varicella chicken pox. We don't see it as much, but you know what? The other day I had a kid with myringitis, bullous myringitis. What is that? A bulle, a chicken pox bleb on his eardrum. Had exquisite ear pain. So we're seeing different presentations of it, uh, but it is an acute contagious disease, herpes virus, infected pretty much 48 hours prior to the outbreak tend to lesions crust over, school age kids, you know the, how it runs. It goes erythema, papules, vesicles, intense puritis, low-grade fever, um, adenopathy. There's a good thought about what it might look like. And you can have chill. Before we came out with the varicella vaccine, they used to get, kids used to get them all over, all the way through the alimentary tract, mouth, down the throat, all the way down the GI tract, out through the anus. It's very painful. So non-typically clinical diagnosis, we have a vaccine, we use all the good things like supportive treatment. I always tell people, I'm so excited, I wish I had come up with this Calamite, Caladryl Clear. Remember, because you know the old Calamine lotion makes your skin look kind of powdery pink, right? And so Caladryl Clear has a little Benadryl in it and it really helps, you know, calm that down. Antihistamines, acetaminophen, good old oral acyclovir has been used within 24 hours to help do what? What does it do? It helps to shorten the course and the severity of symptoms. Molluscum. You have not lived until you've had a kid with molluscum, right? That's right. So you know what I'm saying? So molluscum, it's a benign viral skin infection. Lesions resolve on their own. Yes, they do. As long as kids don't touch them and keep auto-inoculating themselves, right? Diagnostic criteria is puritic. If they're sexually active or abused, usually in the genital area you may see some. And those that are, have eczema, immunosuppression may have severe infection. Any child that already has some type of other chronic skin disorder that gets another skin infection, they're usually going to have it much more full-blown. Lesions present on the face, axilla, anacubital, trunk, curl, and extremities, itching at the site. That's what it is. They see them, they touch them, they scratch them, they auto-inoculate themselves. That's what it looks like. Kind of like fleshier chicken pox. Pretty much it's the history of being exposed to it. So the exposure is getting it on the skin and touching it and touching it and making it appear in other areas. Mechanical removal. Well, yeah, that can happen, but you've got to be very cautious. We would not do that in primary care. Curatage, local anesthesia, you're really worried about any type of scarring, especially if it's on the face. 
But look at all the agents that could be used. Good old Trentoyan gel. Uh, you got a Clusol. Um, good old, you know, liquid nitrogen. We use liquid nitrogen for all this all the time. Trichlorosteic acid, silver nitrate, lots of different agents. Prevent scratching. It usually is, I love this, it says resolve six to nine months. I've had a kid, I have a kid that's had it for about two years because he keeps, he won't stop touching his, you know, touching them. And so they just keep, you know, all inoculating. If you get real extensive or it just doesn't seem to clear up or it gets worse, go ahead and refer them to dermatology. You also will see a lot of atopic dermatitis. This is a pink pig. This is a fancy term for what? Eczema. Chronic skin condition, intense itching, typical pattern distribution, periods of remission, exacerbation, usually in low humidity, like winter, when the air is dry, <clears throat> is when it's worsened, is when it worsens. And um, also helpful personal family history. You think about those individuals that you know have asthma, um, allergic rhinitis, or they are eosinophilic, the, uh, the IgE, tend to have these types of skin infections. So puritis, dry skin, they can have flare-ups, scaly, scabby, dry, leathery, liquefied skin, where they scratch it so much that it just thickens up. Um, you know, you can think about rash testing, skin testing, dust mite allergy, food allergies are really a little bit less common for this, it's really more like asthma but your IgE will be elevated in sonophilia on your labs. I always tell patients, and they're just amazed how simple something is. You know, it's like, I'm not big on putting patients on medication, but if you can give them some strategy that's simple, dry skin management is the hallmark. That means when they get out of the bath, leave the water on the bath, you know, in the, out of the bathtub or the shower, leave it on their skin, Tell them to take some type of a cream emulant or a lubricant. I usually like to say Eucerin or Aquaphor. Give them the name of something. They should trap that water into their skin. It's not going to look pretty. It's going to look all white and messy like, oh, my gosh, is this ever going to, you know, be absorbed. Tell them to go brush their teeth. Their skin is so dry, it's so thirsty. By the time they finish brushing their teeth, it's soaked in. And it really does work. Topical steroids may be needed, but I'll tell you, that's, that's, we don't go anything above anything very mild. But systemic steroids in, in severe cases, and I will just tell you, for primary care exam, for us in primary care, usually we're not supposed to do anything much beyond like a medrol dose pack or a prednisone taper in primary care. Anything that's going to be long-term um, steroids needs to be referred out to the specialist. And you need to let them know about acute weeping, using like alumina subacetate solution or a veno baths, colloidal baths, those kinds of things, okay? Now, allergic contact dermatitis, this is where somebody, what is the most common um, agent that causes this? Do you know what it is? Because you got things like, you think about anything that is a chemical or an allergen or a plant, I'll tell you right now, nickel. Nickel is the most common, right. And so while we think about poison ivy and all the other things, but we know it causes redness, puritis, scabbing, vesicles weep, scaling, erythema, thickened skin in a chronic state. Where they've been, what they've been exposed to will give you an idea. Hot and swollen, you know, what is it that they've been exposed to? So we think about now, thinking about a couple pictures here. Little hand on the left is an impetigenized hand. Impetigo, secondary infection. On your right is going to be liquefaction, somebody that's like scratching and excoriating an area. So really pretty much management is symptom management, cool compresses. But when you think about high potency topical steroids locally, usually that's a dermatologist that's needed. And severe systemic prednisone, but a taper, we can do tapers in primary care. Now, this irritant dermatitis, an example of this I'm going to get into is diaper dermatitis. You're thinking, diaper dermatitis, why are we spending time on this? Well, I'm going to try and make a point for you. Commonly, is due to any type of exposure to chemical, urine, you know, you think about stool. Infants is the common period. They get a fiery red rash, papules, vesicles, crusts, ulcerations, very irritable. And look at this. Wow, isn't that awesome? You think, and that's pretty extreme. But the point that I want to make to you is how are you going to treat something like this? You've got to be careful. 
because if they have a fungal infection, you put some type of hydrocortisone, you can exacerbate a fungal infection. You want to think about, see the white area and down here through the anus and down here, that's all fungal. So you want to be very cautious. And it's kind of hard to see, but this is ex very excoriated raised. So when you think about how you're going to manage it, well, mild cases, a barrier emulent. Um, you think about zinc oxide products, you know, you, those, those different pastes. I always laugh when I think about butt paste. As whoever came up with that name. But um, erythema papules present. You know, if it's just a little bit of mild irritation, you can use a 1% hydrocortisone. Sometimes using Domboro or Burrow's solution to help cleanse um, the areas that are excoriated with vesicles. If it's a bacterial infection, you're probably going to need topical antibiotics, such as a good one is Mupiracin or Bactroban. Secondary fungal infections, topical fungal agents uh, would be necessarily, uh, would be need to be ordered. Nizoral cream, ketoconazole, things like that. Educate the parent um, based on, you know, keeping the area open, dry, clean, and all those good things um, are important. Psoriasis. Pretty, uh, when you think about this, this is a condition that we see across the lifespan. And you can see here approximately 3 to 5% of the population, inflammatory skin disorder, acute chronic. What happens is... This is a hyperproliferative inflammatory skin disorder. What happens is, like people that don't have psoriasis, your skin cells, you know, change over every 14 days. I mean, it's a process. You know, you lose skin cells. But for somebody that has psoriasis, it's every two days. It never keratinizes. Epidermis turns over very quickly. It's very faulty. Epidermis is thickened. Anytime, I want to draw your attention to this, anytime you see something that's nucleated, it's always, an, uh, and here's one for you, um, it's always an immature cell. So if you see a nucleated skin cell, that means the body is what? Compensating by making more cells. When we talk about anemia, if you've got nucleated RBCs, it's compensating by making more cells quickly. Usually mature cells do not have a nucleus. Um, epidermis is thickened, mediologic, immunologically mediated. Pretty much you've got your lesions, red, sharply defined plaque, silvery scale, pitting of the nails. You can get an intergluteal uh, line, pink or red line. Auspice sign has to do with just lifting a little bit of the plaque and getting a few droplets. Now, very various stages here. See, so you've got some of the plaque here, some that has healed. You've seen individuals that have it in areas like under the breast, into the vaginal area, on, in between the thighs. You can see it in various areas. Um, we see here psoriasis, silvery scale. If you were to lift a little bit of the edge, you got a couple of drops, auspice sign. So pretty much, I'll tell you this, anybody who has psoriasis needs a dermatologist. They need a dermatologist to maximize the care. Now you may still do things for them in your practice, but they, they, you know, topicals for the scalp and steroids for the skin, but things like UVB light, light treatments. Uh, they need moisturizer. That good old atopic uh, der dermatitis, when I told you about the um, dry skin management, works very well for that. Um, Pitorias rosea. Don't you love these terms? Mild acute inflammatory disorder, usually self-limiting, lasting three to eight weeks. Causes unknown, they think it's viral. Spring and fall, you know, pretty much follows your eyes. And we think about, now, this particular, I'm going to go ahead for just to show you. There's a herald patch. Sometimes you don't even see it, right? But it usually, if I could go back and say the herald patch is an initial lesion. It's very light-colored, crinkled appearance, color at scale. And then... And it's there for about maybe five to ten days, and then it comes out with the Christmas tree pattern, puritic rash. And what it looks like is somewhat like this. It's kind of a fine uh, rash, and, and I see you doing your hands like this. What it does is across the back, if you were to use the axis of the spine, and you were going to splay the rash out, it kind of looks like the bowels of a Christmas tree, the way it's distributed, Okay. And so that's kind of like what it would it look like. And um, 
So serology testing would be important, though, because I'll tell you why. Usually in pityriasis rosea, the rash is itchy. If you have a rash that looked like that, the one with the Christmas tree pattern, and you had it in the buccal mucosa, the palms and soles of your, of your um, extremities, um, your feet and your hands, you probably need to run a test for, for syphilis, okay, because it mimics the syphilis rash, especially if it's non-puritic. So some of the things you want to think about because of a child that has this, puritis using Adirax, oral antihistamines. Um, we've got some other topical antipuritics like Sarna lotion, Prax, Cetaphil, cool compresses, the oatmeal baths, and maybe some topical steroids. Sometimes also, very commonly, it's very helpful to put them on a short course of oral erythromycin, two-week course. Sunlight exposure would be helpful. I know you all have seen impetigo. What's classic with impetigo? Impetigo, you know, is a bacterial infection. It's the honey-crusted uh, lesion. And we know that on the face, it can be anywhere. It's highly contagious, typically in the summer. It's all inoculable. Very classic, the honey-crusted lesions, pain, swelling, infodenopathy. We also think, yeah, you could culture it, but usually we go by what we observe clinically. So, you know, and you can, you've seen them. And I just showed, you know, the, the child with the um, hand. Pretty much symptomatic treatment, and we got your antimicrobials that can be applied topically like Umipiracin or Bactroban. And then you can have your oral beta-lactamase resistant antibiotics for staph, dicloxilin, cephalaxin, which is good old Keflex, erythromycin, cleosin, strep, penicillin, erythromycin. Maybe they may even need some surgical excision, especially if it's a very wide area. Um, they're supposed to abstain from school. 48 hours they're considered um, uh, contagious. And then, of course, you could use Domburo's or Burrow's solution to cleanse the area. Scabies. You know, they say the scabies might can jump eight feet. Y'all all going to start scratching, right? Um, highly contagious. Might the burrows in the stratum corneum incubates four to six weeks, initial exposure, then it spreads by contact personal items. You know, you go to Disney, well, y'all have Disneyland out here. We have Disney World. You go to the, one of those places, and you know you, your kids want to get all dressed up, put the hats on, and get their picture taken in that booth. Well, I used to be the worst mama because I wouldn't let them do that because I was always thinking they were going to pick something up. But, you know, that's how it spreads. Intense inching irritability, lin linear curve burrows. Infants, typically wherever you have any type of exposure, head, neck, palms, soles. Older children, red papules, skin folds, umbilicus, abdomen. And you may see some regional adenopathy. Isn't this an awesome exposure? Usually you think about if a mite is burrowing in the skin, you're only going to see a few. This is like taking over the whole system. And you think about what's classic with this. They like to get into warm areas. Interdigital, right? And then looking up closer, there is one of the burrows. If you were going to scrape that and get a little sample of what's in there, mites, ova, and feces. That doesn't sound too good, does it? And... Um, so we think about management, NICS, 5% rinse, first treatment, leave on 8 to 14 hours, repeat in a week if you need it, if the rash is still present. Lindane lotion. Lindane is what I used to use a lot in, in Haiti because it's inexpensive, but it's not to be used in babies under the age of six months or pregnant women. It's highly teratogenic, okay? Rash, washable items, store all your non-washable items for a week, antihistamines for puritis. Now, Lyme disease. Um, do you all have a lot of uh, Lyme uh, tick bites out here? Oh, my goodness, are we just inundated with it over in my, in my part of the country. There's the little tick. It's a small one, and it's one of the vectors. It's most common northeast, upper Midwest, Pacific Coast out here with you guys, but we have just, it seems like... My husband can't go out in the yard without getting tick bit. I mean, every day he comes in with some kind of, because we have a huge yard, we grow orchids, and he's always out there tending things under the tree. It seems like he always gets one. But you also want to think about mice, deer, tick, which are usually the small ones. Birds can be a source for it. You can get them off of pets. Um, this, it's a spirochete. Now, this, in the pediatric literature, they say ticks, that must feed it more 24 hours to transmit the infection. In the adult literature, they say 36 to 48 hours. I say get the tick off. 
Just, if you see a tick, get them off. You know, tick, do a tick check, make sure. It's staged, the, st the, the symptoms. So stage one is erythema migrans, flat, slightly raised red lesions. Like it's called the bullseye mark, central clearing. Also flu-like symptoms. Um, we usually recommend that if a patient has a, um, has a tick bite, you want them to come in pretty soon because you probably want to put them on a short course of antibiotic, usually what? Doxycycline. Classic right here, Lyme disease. The central target lesion, concentric rings, often shows a central clearing. And then um, on a toddler, you can see the swelling here, erythema migraines on the right thigh. So you think about headaches, stiff joints, migratory pains uh, in stage two, even to the point of having dysrhythmias and heart block. Bell's palsy, my hairdresser, that's, she's a, she hikes all the time. That's how she developed, she had done a lot of hiking, and she developed Bell's palsy. Well, Bell's palsy can be caused by a lot of different things, like a virus or whatever, but that's what they pretty much associated that with. Peripheral neuropathy, aseptic meningitis. When you get into stage three, you're getting into this joint periarticular pain, encephalopathy. There's even some other skin discoloration, distal extremity. Not a real good picture here in terms of, but the child was bitten way up in the arm and distal, the arm, almost like, remember the term acrocyanosis? So it looks like an acrocyanosis into the distal area of that extremity. Well, you know, you can do, detect the antibodies, you can do antibody testing, um, and um, you can also do, of course, good old Western blot is always considered confirmatory. Culture the skin through an aspirate, look at your outset rate, and also think about where has the person been in the last 30 days that maybe has been near um, a t a, uh, in the habitation of where the ticks are usually found. Well, what are we going to do about management? Management is pretty involved. But for primary care, infection is confined to the skin. Under the age of seven, we use amoxicillin is mainly the main choice. And over the age of seven, doxy. Pretty much if they move on to stage two or three, they need to see a specialist. Who would you send them to? Infectious disease, okay? There's even, in my area, there's even doctors that are infectious disease. They're Lyme specialists. That's all they do is see Lyme patients. That's how many we've got in our area. So we're going to look at measles. You know, there's a lot of different measles. The first one I want to go over is rubeola, ordinary measles, acute, highly contagious viral disease. Complicated with ear infection, pneumonia, encephalitis, acute thrombocytopenia purpura, and maybe even an encephalitis. Very defined, diffuse area. You can see here kind of confluent measles. And they're probably going to have some, you know, coryza, runny nose, eyes, um, spreading skin, skin rash. And this particular one has Coplic spots. You know who that is? Dr. Coplic in New York in 1965 identified these and got his name on it. And where they are is they're in the buccal mucosa. It's a white spot. Very classic with these other symptoms with the rash that you'll see. And um, pretty much we can't do anything about it other than provide comfort measures, pain management, and make sure they're not dehydrated. Rubella is, is a viral disease known for its teratogenicity uh, pretty much just being around those that are inadequately immunized. So you think about uh, why it's so important for babies to, do their, to, to have their MMRs done. And fine, this is the one, that a lot of people refer to this as the three-day measles. It starts pretty much on the face, spreads to the extremities and trunk, and is gone in 72 hours. It's very fine, very lacy, erythematous rash, malaise, joint pain, some adenopathy. Oh, and you notice it says post auricular and sub occipital where is that post and sub occipital is where you're going to get most of the adenopathy and the reason i point that out to you is sometimes when we do in a few moments we're going to do eent and when we talk about epstein barr versus a strep pharyngitis is it anterior posterior you know what i'm saying so they are very specific on the test with that um, management uh, we do want to educate pregnant women about the, you know, the dangers of, it, of highly teratogenic measles. Peak, right? Look at that. That's, a, that's an awesome thought there with the very fine, very lacy. 
um, sudden onset, upper arms, legs, trunk, dorsum, hands and feet. It's almost like reminds me of somebody that's been out in the wind, like in the cold wind. It's any area that's going to be exposed, the face, the upper, you know, the dorsum. Um, it, the rash can last, um, you know, more than a month and can cause fetal aplastic crisis and arthralgias in parents. So when we think about um, fine rashes here, classic slap cheek along the arms, see here, so all of that. Um, we want to think about managing, well, pretty much patient education, uh, especially the mother with the uh, fetal anemia. And you're probably going to need to give the pregnant woman, like if it's the mother of the child and she's pregnant, give her some immune globulin. Adult patients that are around children that have um, had this, like if you're a teacher, you have a lot of kids in the class that tend to have that. You typically get some arthralgias associated with it. Here's roseola infantum, which is six disease. Did you know we had a six disease? And the reason I'm going into so much with measles, believe it or not, they've had, I, I didn't really tell you, but pink pig for the whole measles section. Measles has been really beefed up on the exam. So mild contagious illness, herpes virus six, no viable treatment. Typically six months to two years, it's rare after four. This kid, isn't he cute? Isn't he just darling? Looks like he's like, like you scared him, right? But you could see how that rash is. So you see so many of these present. Can you see how it would be difficult to kind of tease them out? Respiratory illness, high fever, abrupt end, possible seizures, and they have the small pink flat, slightly raised bumps on the trunk and their extremities. Here's another one you haven't lived until you had a kid with this, okay? This is a highly contagious viral illness, affects um, hand, foot, and mouth disease, Kosaki virus, affects children younger than 10, can last upwards of a week. Um, these kids are pretty miserable. Parents are pretty miserable, trying to get them to eat or drink something. They drool, vomit, malaise, fever. They get a rash on their hands and their feet. Uh, trying to show that in the tongue and the buccal mucosa, fingers, um, thinking about lesions on the digits. So, you know, it's very painful. And really, there's nothing you can do. It's viral. Treat them symptomatically. Try them to get them to drink, eat anything, popsicles, juices, fruit, you know, those kinds of things. That was an awesome chapter, wasn't it? A lot going on in there, right? So you all feel how you can see how the connection between skin and infectious disease, really knowing your measles.